So I've noticed already that our man from the Antarctic is here. And normally when we connect with people, we're pretty sure they've got a good signal and we get a bit blasé these days, don't we, that we've all got a good Wi-Fi. But we were slightly concerned about how the connection would be in Antarctica, um, because depending how the, the, the satellites are placed, there's some favorable times. So I'm going to take a jump and bring Ryan in a bit early, if I may. Um, and let's just see what happens. It's in. Look at that. Hello. Hello, everybody. Uh, <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, Paul, for inviting me. And as you said, our internet is not great down here. We are on a satellite uplink. So hopefully you guys can all hear me. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. I saw you there a bit earlier. I thought I'd jump you in. Um, and just so everybody knows, the reason I'm so excited to speak to, to Ryan is that he's at my old base, Rother Research Station in Antarctica, <laughs> inarguably the most beautiful research station in the universe. <laughs> and Ryan runs a project that is it's called RATS, and, um, but it doesn't have anything to do with RATS. It's a long-term data set that was installed in 1997 at Rotherham. And uh, Ryan's going to talk about you know, collecting water samples from the very bottom of the world. And we had an interesting conversation because in the early days of setting up this year's Global Biodiversity Festival, we took titles, you know, what are you going to speak about? Obviously, Ryan said, well, I'm going to speak about rats. Rather, you know, Ryan Matthews, rats, Antarctica, um, which I said, because I know the project, great. And then quickly we all realized that it, it wasn't necessarily going to be the one to use because everyone would think this man's talking about rats in Antarctica. So anyway, Ryan, I know you're going to get a lot of questions on this. I could talk about you and Rother for hours. Uh, there isn't a huge amount of time. So I'm going to leave it to you um, for your presentation. I'm just looking for it here. Hang on a second. Sorry. We'll find the presentation. Uh, okay, I think here we go. Uh, By the way, where are you in Rothera? Hey, great, I'm in. Okay, buddy, here you go. Over to over to Rothera and Ryan. So we we really do cover seven continents. There you go, Ryan. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. Um, Have fun. Thank you very much for that introduction. Yes, uh, I definitely think I'm a beautiful research station in the world. I'm very, very fortunate to be here. And so welcome. Uh, thank you for inviting me. And really fantastic, these virtual festivals. We're uh, all getting together from around the world. And it'll be really, really cool if, uh, if there's anybody out there who's from these really remote places, get in touch, write a little comment, and we'll see how far we are, how far we're reaching right now be really good in one single session. As Paul said, my name is Ryan Matthews and I'm the Marine Assistant working for the British Antarctic Survey. I'm going to speak to you just a little bit about uh, what my role is down here in Antarctica, uh, the data I'm collecting, what it's about and why we're here. Firstly, where are we? We are um, halfway down the Western Antarctic Peninsula. We're about 1,600 kilometers southeast of Punta Arenas um, on an island called Adelaide Island. Adelaide Island is about 100 kilometers long. And the reason why we're located here is because there's a small point called Rothera Point um, that's, that actually has some rock. Most of the island is a glacier, it's mountainous, it's full of snow. But this point, the snow melts back and the rock, rock is exposed. Rotherham Research Station has been here since 1975. It's not the first station to have been built on Adelaide Island, um, but it is now the current um, UK's biological research centre in Antarctica. And it's also a hub for the, our deep field research. So we have one of the only rock runways in Antarctica located here on our station. So it can get really busy. During the summer months, 
Royal the Royal Research Station has a population of about 160 people, whereas during the winter months, we only have a population of 23 people. So I'm one of 23 people currently on station here. And most of our team is made up of trade services, people like mechanics and electricians, plumbers. And these guys are really important. They keep the station running, they keep our power on, and they allow us to continue to collect our data and to do our science. So they're really important people and part of the team. Now, uh, we at Rotherham Research Station, we are 67 degrees south of latitude. And that means we are inside the Antarctic polar circle. And what that means is actually in a couple of days on Tuesday, the sun is going to dip below the mountains and we're not going to see the sun for eight weeks. So it's quite an exciting time here at Rotherham. It's also quite a nervous time, quite a scary time and a very dark time, too. But why are we here and why is Antarctica so important? Antarctica is the most remote continent on the planet. It's surrounded by deep, cold water. It's an extremely inhospitable environment. It's cold, it's windy, and it's perhaps the windiest place on Earth. However, biological life absolutely thrives. Our oceans are some of the most abundant regions in the world. But, but why? It's because of the cold waters, they hold a lot of oxygen and a lot of nutrients. And during the summer months with the 24 hours of sunlight, the phytoplankton is able to bloom. And this phytoplankton feeds the krill. And krill is the most abundant species on this planet. And this krill therefore feeds um, the rest of the ecosystem. And what I show you here on my screen is a is a food chain. Antarctica has a very simple food chain. There's not many levels to the food chain. And it's this krill that feeds the entire food chain. So we have this the most abundant species on the planet. And we also have the, some of the largest species to have ever lived on Earth. And that's the blue whales, the humpback whales, and the fin whales. And they all feed upon this krill. So what am I doing down here? As Paul said, I'm running the Rothera Oceanographic and Biological Time Series. It's a program that was set up in 1997 and plans to continue long into the future. And the aims of this project is to one, identify the upper water column parameters and how they relate to global climatic events, such as the El Nino events, and how upper water column parameters influence biological processes and finally how and to what extent does the variability in the timing and intensity of summer phytoplankton bloom affect key ecological processes so how do we collect data well i'm fortunate enough that i get to go out on the water most days or at least when the weather is good we do get these amazing blue sunshine days icebergs floating around we get to go out on the boats and we get to collect our data. Other days, the sea is actually freezing. So this is pancake ice forming on the surface of the water. And this makes it very difficult for us to move around in the boats. And then there's the other day, the other day when it's super, super cold and all the water, all the sea is actually freezing. And this is a, our boat, which is the the sea spray has actually completely frozen over the, on the boat. So what do we do when we're out on the boat? We do this CTD and water sampling events. CTD stands for conductivity, temperature and depth. It's a probe that we drop down to 500 meters. Now, we're only our sample site is only one kilometer offshore and we get depths of 500 meters. And this is super deep. And to put this into perspective, the UK shelf waters are less than 200 metres in depth. So we've got this really deep water that we drop our probe down to. And this probe measures conductivity, temperature and depth. It also measures light intensity and fluorescence. fluorescence. And fluorescence is a measure of chlorophyll content in the water. The probe measures, takes a measurement 
every two seconds, which equates to around every two minutes through the water column. Uh, if anyone's wondering how we keep warm in Antarctica, it's because we have a hand winch. And then up once the probe reaches 500 meters, we have to hand winch that probe back to the surface and that warms us up quite nicely. So once we've done our CTD cast, we then collect water samples. Again, we drop the we drop a Niskin bottle, which is a, a plastic bottle, which which is able to contain water at various depths. And we bring this back onto the boat, again, more winching, keeping warm again. Uh, we store the samples on the boat and then we take them back to the laboratory for analysis and preservation. This is a example of the data we receive from our CTD casts. And what you can see on the left hand side of the graph is depth. So the top of the graph is our surface and the bottom of the graph is 500 meters of depth. And the graph on the left shows temperature and salinity. And what you can see is at the surface, temperature on this day was about minus 1.3. As we descend through the water column, that temperature actually increases to about one degrees. And this is really, really interesting. So in the rest of the world where you get the warm surface waters, down here in the polar regions, you get cold surface waters and warm, deeper waters. On the graph on the left, you, we've got our measure of fluorescence, which is a measure of chlorophyll content in the water. And as you can see, that chlorophyll content is measured actually all the way down to 500 meters. So even though this was a measurement, it was taken a few, few weeks ago, we are in the winter months, the summer phytoplankton bloom has died off. We are still measuring chlorophyll, chlorophyll in the water column. So if we take this data, what we're able to do is look is actually look back over time. Beginning of this graph is back 20 years. And this graph shows temperature at 15 meters. And every single point on this graph is a CTD event for the last 20 years. And what you can see is we get these cyclic changes. We get a few warm years and then the temperatures drop down and we get a few cold and a couple of colder years. You'll notice that during the summer months, temperatures reach to about one degrees or higher. And during the winter months, we only get a maximum or minimum, I should say, of minus 1.8 degrees Celsius. The reason why it doesn't go below minus 1.8 degrees is because seawater will actually freeze at this temperature. So last year, we actually had one of the warmest summers in the last 20 years. Um, and you'll also notice we had very few um, days, very few events where we recorded this minus 1.8 degrees. On top of this, we obtain uh, the water samples. Now these water samples, uh, we take back to the lab and we measure for a number of different parameters. Chlorophyll, um, although the CTD cast takes chlorophyll, it's a measure of fluorescence. So we take a physical measurement of the chlorophyll once we're back in the lab as well. We also take ammonia and ammonia is important because uh, ammonia is important nutrient as it has been suggested that the polar phytoplankton prefer to utilize ammonia over other sources of inorganic nitrogen. So we take a measurement immediately when we get back to the lab as well. Now our other parameters, carbon dioxide, nutrients, bacteria and viruses, algae, oxygen isotopes, metagenomics and salinity. We preserve these samples and they get sent back to the UK and off to our collaborators where they can analyze them. And all this data along with the CTD cast gets pulled together and then we're able to discern and identify the state of our oceans and how things are changing throughout the year, throughout the seasons and over a longer period of time. Now, I just wanted to show you this picture. It's a fantastic picture that was taken during the summer months. 
And you can see how green the water is. All of these benthic animals, they're currently filter feeder, feeding. It's a really rich environment, um, super green, lots and lots of life. Really, really cool. On top of these oceanographic data, we obtain uh, physical measurements of what's going on on the, on the sea. Changes in our environment, especially around the polar regions, are extremely complex. So even if we consider the single variables, such as temperature, we're going to struggle to understand what's going on. So we try and combine the physical and the chemical parameters. So sea ice is one of those physical variables that we measure. Every day I record the sea ice north and south of the station. And we also have this camera set up that looks out over the bay. And this camera takes a picture once every 24 hours. So you can see on the picture on the left hand side of the screen, uh, this is taken during the summer months when there's no sea ice in the bay. And during the winter months, which is the picture on the right hand side, the sea ice extends beyond the glacier. It's actually very hard to discern the edge of the glacier and the sea ice here. And this sea ice will actually extend kilometers out to sea. And the the land mass, or I should say the, the area of Antarctica, almost doubles in size during the winter month because the sea ice extends through, extends and expands. So why is sea ice so important? Well, what we know is that sea ice forms on the surface of the water. If the sea ice is a permanent feature, then we call this an ice shelf. And we've already discussed how the ecosystems here are driven by the primary production and photosynthesis of the phytoplankton algae. So sea ice actually forms a barrier and stops the light from reaching the ocean. And therefore we can consider life under the sea, as, under the sea ice as very limited. So why is this important? Well, we know from our records that ice shelves and ice shelves around Antarctica are breaking down. And we also know from our records that the duration of winter sea ice is decreasing. What does this mean? Well, with less sea ice, icebergs are free to move around more. Now, an iceberg, only 10% of the iceberg, or roughly 10% of the iceberg, is above the surface water. The rest of the iceberg is below, and these keels can extend deep below the surface. So as these icebergs move around, especially in the shallow waters, they cause scours and they destroy habitats. And this is really important because they cause devastation on a seabed, simil similar to that of benthic trawling and dredging around the world. And this has serious consequences on the ecosystems down here. A lot of the animals are very slow growing and they live for a long time. So not only are these benthic communities really vulnerable, but they also provide a, a huge ecosystem function. These benthic communities store carbon, carbon. As they grow, they store carbon. And we're all well aware that carbon dioxide levels are increasing at a rapid rate across the globe. And so we actually rely a lot on our biological communities to buffer, extract and sequester this extra carbon. So as these icebergs are moving around, because of there's less sea ice around to hold them in place, they are mobilizing this stored carbon. However, if we take a look at the greater depths where these icebergs are unable to cause such a devastation, what we see is an increase in immobilized carbon. Because we have lost that physical barrier of sea ice, we're getting more light into the water column which means more photosynthesis, longer phytoplankton blooms, and therefore more carbon sequestration. So now we're really start starting to see the complex nature of how ecosystems are responding to a changing world. And how does this interact with life history traits of our benthic species? Well, to understand this, we go and collect animals on a monthly basis. So I have the absolute pleasure to go out and go diving and plunging into the Antarctic waters in scuba gear. And this is the highlight of my job. Absolutely love it. And yes, if you're wondering, it's extremely cold. 
um, but we're now used to it. So the seawater is now currently at minus 1.7 degrees Celsius. And as you can see, the sea is freezing around us. It's not quite at that point where the sea ice has formed. Um, but later on during the winter, when we have the sea ice, we'll be heading out, we'll be cutting holes in the ice and we'll be continuing to dive. Now, what do we do when we dive? Well, we're collecting species and I collect eight species. We collect the Odontasta, which is a cushion star, collect a brittle star, a sea urchin, a limpet, a bivalve, a terabellid worm, a nematean worm, and a sea cucumber. And they're all really keystone species in this environment. And what we do is we collect these species, we bring them back into the the lab and then they get preserved before they get sent back to the UK. One of the main objectives um, of this part of the project is to identify the reproductive viability of these species and then we can correlate this or relate this to the season and other climatic variables and also those oceanographic parameters that we previously spoke about. Not only this, um, this data this sample, sample set has also been used um, to backtrack in species identification. As technology has improved, we're able to go back through this time series and identify further species. So whereas we only thought we had one species of terabellid worm, we now know we've been collecting up to seven species. Now this data set has also been used in other projects. Um, a project that's happening at the moment is a microplastic study. And what's happening, what they're do, doing is looking at microplastic accumulation in species over time. So these preserved animals from Antarctica, 10, 20 years of data, 20 years of preserved animals, were able to look back over time at how much microplastics has been accumulated in here. So as well as preserving species, we also collect live Antarctic specimens for transport. So this is a really logistical challenge. We send live animals back to the UK where they're held in the British Antarctic Aquarium facilities in Cambridge. As a really uh, marvel feat of engineering, we, the animals go live on the ship through the tropics. We keep them alive back to the UK. And this is really important because it allows scientists to, scientists to have access to these polar species throughout the year and without having to be in Antarctica and through the challenges of living and working in Antarctica. So why is this all important? Well, these long-term data sets, they have enormous value in detecting the short-term and long-term changes. Our changes around the world occur over a couple of years, over a couple of decades or even longer. So we really need to have these long-term data. Ch changes in our environment are extremely complex. So by combining the biological and the physical and the oceanographic, we're able to try and break down uh, the complex processes into bite-sized pieces. And the preserved specimens provide the opportunity to look back over time at how things are changing as well. I'm also involved in Ocean Sampling Day, and this is an event that occurs on the 21st of June. Um, it's been going since 2014, and the project is aimed at producing a snapshot of marine microbial diversity across the world. So other research institutes, academic institutes, citizen science, everybody collects water, filters the water, and identifies the microbial diversity in a single point of time. So it's a really, really cool, and it's a great collaborative project. So thank you very much for joining me. I hope the internet has held up enough that you can hear me. Uh, and I'd like to say a big thank you to the Global Biodiversity uh, Festival um, producers and those that have got this festival together. It's a really fantastic festival, so thank you very much. Wow, bravo, well done Ryan, couldn't have been better. Thanks so much.
And, you know, it's great personally for me to be reconnecting with Rothera naturally and to hear the stories, all the things that are music to my ears, the value of long term data sets. You, I don't know if you've been able to follow any of the activity on the festival so far, but we've had some great inputs regarding sustainable investment. This business of the fact that, you know, the old fashioned unsustainable investments and fossil fuel investments aren't doing very well and the, the green or blue or healthier uh, ESG and natural capital type investments are doing really well. And I celebrate the thing that we're describing right here, which is this thin, unseen, beautiful thread that connects global economies with the work that you're doing. You're swimming around in <laughs> minus two water nearly, collecting worms and all the rest and taking temperatures and taking this long term data set. And you should know, and it certainly gave me a big lift, Ryan, was when we discovered that all of these global economies of all kinds count on our data. So that's what, you know, that's what gets you out the tent every morning or gets you into your suit every day. It's exciting business. So thanks for all that. It was absolutely great. I was interested, a um, couple of questions from me. You, you, you gave the list of collections and I remember swimming around on, on my dives. We collected lots of glyptonosis. Do you still collect them? I Sorry, Paul. I can't quite catch you there. I think you. I think you may have asked whether we kept collect glyptonotus. Um, we did collect some glyptonotus last summer. That was sent back live to uh, the UK. Um, I don't know if we'll be collecting any more this year. And I remember also collecting those worms, those uh, nematine worms. Uh, we used to get those from the northern end of the uh, runway uh, dive. There, that was quite. Quite a thing, collecting them there and also in the bay. You know, collect. I'm interested. You still collect those? Well, I didn't like them very much. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. The the nematine worms. They're so. I I really like them. They're one of our most ferocious predators down here. They're those those white worms. They extend to about two meters in length, and when you pick them up, they contract into a small ball. So you think they're really big ferocious predators and you pick them up and then they just curl up into a small ball and they're quite slimy as well so. <laughs> yeah they used to, they, they used to give me the willies and i remember the big drama was um uh, never get any lost in the in the uh, aquarium in case they sort of polluted or ate everything else <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah that's right we have to be careful with them <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. Well, Ryan, you've got now, um, I think you said there was no more, no sea ice yet, but does it feel like it's forming? Can you see anything? Sorry, Paul, could you say that again? It's all right. Just asking about sea ice, uh, whether it's coming or not. Uh, yeah, so the sea ice did start to form a few weeks ago. Um, it got quite exciting. We all thought it was coming. But as with the case of living on the windiest windiest continent on earth we've had two weeks of gale force winds so actually the sea ice has all blown out the surface waters have actually increased in temperature because of the wind it was a northerly wind and that's increased the local temperatures so we are at a point where if the wind stops blowing then the sea ice is going to start forming so fingers crossed we hope it comes in soon yeah, we've got our fingers crossed here for it. And of course, it's only a month and you'll be having uh, midwinter. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, everybody's getting ready. Uh, we have a big celebration here at midwinter. We all make presents for each other. Um, it's a bit of a tradition down here to make the mid midwinter's gift. So I'm not going to say what I'm making just in case there's other people listening. <laughs> Where are you speaking? Are you in the Are you in the lab right now? I'm in the Bonner, yes. I'm in my uh, office down in the Bonner Aquarium, down at oh, the Bonner Lab. Sorry, it's it's doing. It's, it, this is a brilliant presentation, Ryan. Thanks very much. And you know, highlighting the fact that we can understand, be, begin to uh, manage, and 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 love these approaches to global issues by falling in love with places. And for me, it's always been Antarctica. That's my touch point for understanding most global issues. So you've done a great job of telling us the value of long-term data, the, 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 the complete commitment it takes to get it, and it's fallen into the festival 
at the perfect time because we've had two brilliant presentations on finance. We've got some more coming up. And so I hope you get the same energy I do when you realize that every single data point that you make, every single collection is driving global economies. So keep it up. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely yeah it's super it's super important what we do and it is a logistical challenge so every, every it takes everybody down here to collect this data so we couldn't do it without all the plumbers and electricians and and mechanics so yeah it's a uh, it, it's a marvel how we collect the data and it is yeah, really important. absolutely absolutely brilliant and, and and i gave a talk yesterday on the value of um of um uh, science support i said it's the thing i've spent my life in you know and and i'm hoping i've had a lot of emails and contacts about that people looking to get into the science support world so it's great that you you recognize the value of the science support team all right then ryan hey look say hello to everybody at the base for me give rather a bit of a sort of virtual oh. hug for me i'll pass that on yeah <laughs> thanks very much thank you very that. much paul we can now say we've covered all seven continents. How great is that? And we've still got Nadia to come from there. So thanks very much, sir. Have a great winter. Bye -bye. Take it easy. Good luck.